Good evening, everyone. If you could all please come into the room and take your seats, I think there will be just enough seats for everyone. Thank you all for coming and welcome to the library. I'm Lisa Oldham, I'm the director here at the library and it is my very great honor uh, to welcome you all here and to have our very distinguished guests. We have, of course, our speaker tonight, Chris Whipple. We also have, I can't see over the podium, <clears throat> Susie Kramer, who is Mr. Atwood's daughter. And <laughs> Susie Kramer arrived in town about an hour ago and so turn down my request to speak about her dad or the program. So I'll say a few quick words about the Atwood Lecture as we haven't had, we had a bit of a hiatus on the Atwood Lectures. The Atwood Memorial Lecture honors longtime New Canaanite William Atwood. In the course of his career, he defined the times and shaped the causes in which he believed. Enabling the library to present distinguished speakers, the endowment for this lecture honors Bill's memory and his lifetime interest in journalism, government, literature, and politics. And I believe tonight's speaker will cover all of those topics quite thoroughly. I also want to make special thanks to John and Anda Hutchins, I'm not sure where Anda is, <laughs> for uh, interceding on our behalf and getting Chris to come and speak tonight and for making it all possible. Thank you very, very much. I think everyone who's here this evening will understand why we're very hopeful of getting a larger auditorium in a new library space. <laughs> One with air conditioning, even. <clears throat> and lights that won't be just on or off, which you'll experience in a moment. <laughs> so uh, I don't want to go too much further. Uh, thank you all for, for coming out tonight. I know you're going to enjoy this, and I'd like to turn this over to John Hutchins, who will introduce Chris for us. This is going to be fun. <laughs> I'm delighted to introduce this year's Atwood speaker, Chris Whipple. The expression, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, appropriately describes Chris. His father, Cal, was a longtime Washington correspondent for Life magazine and was instrumental in loosening wartime censorship rules governing showing the images of dead soldiers. This was a big deal. FDR signed off on that um, at, at one point. Uh, Chris grew up in Old Greenwich and graduated from Yale in 1975. He's had a distinguished career as a television journalist, winning multiple Peabody and Emmy Awards while at 60 Minutes uh, CBS News 60 Minutes and ABC News Primetime. He is currently the chief executive officer of his own production company, which recently produced the acclaimed Showtime documentary entitled The Spy Masters, CIA in the Crosshairs, a groundbreaking look into the CIA through the eyes of all 12 living CIA directors. It's pretty amazing. His new book entitled The Gatekeepers, How the White House Chiefs of Staff Define Every Presidency, is the first in-depth, behind-the-scenes look at the men who have been the president's closest advisors, whose actions, and in some cases, inactions, have defined the course of our country. Unelected and unconfirmed, the chief of staff serves at the whim of the president and is the person the president depends on to execute his agenda. Through extensive interviews with all 17 living chiefs and two former presidents, Chris pulls back the curtain on this unique fraternity, whose members include Rahm Emanuel, Dick Cheney, Leon Panetta, and Donald Rumsfeld. Gatekeepers has drawn rave reviews. It has been on both the New York Times and the Amazon bestseller list, probably still is, I failed to do that research, I apologize. <laughs> Tom Brokaw commented, if you're a political junkie or just curious, 
this is the book for you. However, I know Chris better as my Deerfield Academy senior year dormitory proctor partner, <laughs> <clears throat> responsible for overseeing a group of truly unruly sophomores. <laughs> also, as a varsity hockey teammate and fellow tennis enthusiast, it is with pleasure that I introduce this year's Atwood speaker, Chris Whipple. Wow, what an introduction. Um, you know, it, it, I can't really think of any better training to be White House Chief of Staff than to be Proctor with John Hutchins on <laughs> Deerfield Academy Corridor. Um, that, was a, that was a tough job. Um, it, thanks for the introduction. It's, it's really, um, it's too bad it's been such a slow news week. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know what we're going to talk about. Um, you know, it's, it's such an honor to be here um, and to see a lot of friendly faces. Um, you know, people have asked me what led me to write a book about the White House Chiefs, and, and the truth is that it began with a phone call out of the blue from a stranger. Uh, Jules Naudet, uh, the, the filmmaker, uh, had done the iconic documentary 9-11 with his brother, Gideon Naudet, and they wanted to know if I would partner with them on a documentary about, about all the living White House Chiefs of Staff, which we did for the Discovery Channel in 2013. But I thought that film barely scratched the surface of this incredible untold story of 17 living Chiefs of Staff who make the difference between success and disaster for every presidency. You know, actually, I'm shocked that no one else had written this book before. Um, as a reviewer from Goodreads pointed out recently, Quote, the media obsessively scrutinizes the records of key presidential appointees, including cabinet secretaries, Supreme Court justices, and ambassadors. Yet ironically, the appointment most critical to the success of the presidency, the chief of staff, requires no Senate confirmation and receives little public scrutiny, end quote. Well, I, you know, I couldn't have said that better myself. Um, the chiefs are unelected and unconfirmed, hired and fired by the president alone, and yet, as James A. Baker III, Ronald Reagan's chief, told me, um, you know, the, the, the White House chief of staff is the second most powerful job in government. Dick Cheney, who ought to know what he's talking about, says the White House chief has more power, if you want to put it in those terms, than the vice president. What he doesn't often say is, that's true, except when Cheney was vice president. Um, so, you know, back in 2011, I had just left ABC News. Uh, I had no idea how to begin. How do you, how do you, how do you find a home address for Dick Cheney? Um, so my beautiful wife, Carrie, went on the internet, and a few hours later, she came back and said, I've got it. And I said, you've got what? And she said, Cheney's home address. And I said, where did you find it? And she said, warcriminals.org. <laughs> <clears throat> that, that was the first big research breakthrough. Um, the second breakthrough was finding someone who could, help, who could keep me honest as I poured through 50 years of presidential history. And luckily, my good friend from ABC News, Caroline Borgie Keenan, saved me. Um, she signed up as my researcher and became my de facto chief of staff, and she's here tonight, so thank you, Caroline. So one of the great ironies is that the job of White House Chief of Staff, as we now know it, was created by the man who went to prison for the greatest scandal in American history, Richard Nixon's HR, Bob Haldeman. Haldeman's a fascinating character because, on the one hand, he failed to speak truth to power uh, during the Watergate cover-up with Richard Nixon. And yet Haldeman's successors will all tell you that he created the template for the modern White House Chief of Staff a template that presidents have followed ever since and strayed from at their peril. Every president learns often the hard way that he cannot govern effectively without empowering a White House chief of staff as first among equals in the White House to execute his agenda and to tell him what he does not want to hear. History is littered 
with the wreckage of presidencies who did not understand that. Uh, it's a lesson that our current president, oblivious to history, either has not learned or has chosen to ignore. I'd like to uh, begin by just playing a clip from our documentary, The President's Gatekeepers, just to give you an idea of just how relentless the job can be. And now if I can just find that, we will be good to go. I don't see it here, but bear with me. Can I get a little help just finding this? Because um, I don't see it up on the menu. <laughs> What I need is a good producer here. President Reagan was, uh, was adamant about Actually, this is not the one. Can I just back it up for a second? This is the uh, second clip. Sorry about that. It was clip number two that we're looking for. So again, just to give you an idea of the relentlessness of the job. He is the president's most powerful advisor and closest confidant. The White House Chief of Staff is the person the President turns to to transform his agenda into reality. And when big decisions change the course of history, the Chief of Staff is often the only other person in the room. Being the White House Chief of Staff was unquestionably the toughest job I ever had. It's brutal on you. It's brutal on your family. Nothing, nothing, nothing ever comes easy. And it is constant. You gotta kinda get up pretty early to, to meet the president to the punch here, that's for sure. The average day for me would start at 5.30 in the morning. I get up at 5. 4.30, 5 in the morning. Read five newspapers as quickly as I could to get a, a feel for what was going on in the world. Go to the White House. We've got lots of cover today. I'd meet with the CIA briefer. Then you'd meet with the foreign policy team, the economic policy team. Then you'd meet with the White House staff. Then you'd have a larger meeting to talk about what you were going to try to get accomplished that particular day. In an average day, you would deal with things like Bosnia, Northern Ireland, the budget, taxation, the environment. Then you'd have lunch. You have a lunch probably with the vice president. Your announcement of policy or whatever you're doing that day. Get to work. You go on running from the president's office down to the national security briefing on any one foreign policy issues or questions. You got to get a lot of work done. There's bipartisan meetings that you have over at the Hill. We have to have the meeting today. You're meeting with the staff. You're returning phone calls, trying to get something done on behalf of the president. Is there anything breaking on the news? Is there a call the president or you have to make to a senator or a house member to move something? So while you're in a meeting with the president, the left side of your brain is usually operating on what's going on in the Hill or in the press. Somewhere around 6, 6.30, you have a wrap up with the president. He goes home, has dinner. You finish up around 7, 7.30 in the office. Check the staff secretary's office one last time. You go home and you're on the phone on the way home, on the phone during dinner, on the phone while you're reading to your kids at sleep, and you fall asleep before the book ends. And you're woken up at night around one in the morning with probably something bad happening around the world. It's it's a relentless 24-7 job. Uh, the, the chief of staff gets all of the blame and none of the credit. Um, but what, is, what does the chief of staff do? It's almost impossible to overstate the importance of the position in every White House. He is the president's closest confidant, or should be. Uh, he is famously the, the gatekeeper who controls access to the Oval Office, which, which is really a way of creating time and space for the president to think. He's the honest broker. Uh, who has to make sure that every decision is teed up with information on every side and also to ensure that only the toughest decisions get into the Oval Office. He's the, the keeper of the daily message, making sure that everyone is on the same page. Now, by the way, none of this may sound familiar at the moment. Um, 
he is, and he is the person the president relies on to execute his agenda. Um, you know, Jim, James Baker said that he's the person in the centrifuge who, where policy and politics meet. Uh, he's the person who threads the needle between policy and politics. But the hardest part of the job, and the most important part, is telling the president what he does not want to hear. Um, the, the Nixon White House was pretty bad, but it could have been a lot worse. Haldeman often talked Nixon off the ledge when, uh, you know, when he, and, and when that failed, he sometimes ignored cockamamie or even downright illegal orders. At one point, Nixon ordered Haldeman to have the Brookings Institution firebombed. He wanted him to ransack, ransack the place for documents, blow the safe, he said, on the, water, on the White House tapes. Haldeman decided that wasn't such a good idea. Another time, Nixon demanded that every employee of the State Department be given a lie detector test. Well, that was about 50,000 people for openers. Uh, that was another order that Haldeman found easy to ignore. Don Rumsfeld, Jerry Ford's chief, was more direct. As he told me, the White House chief of staff is the one person besides his wife who can look the president straight in the eye and say, this is not right. You simply cannot go down that road. Believe me, it's not going to work. It's a mistake. Dick Cheney puts it this way. You can't have eight or nine guys with a tough message to take to the president sitting around saying, it's your turn to tell him. No, it's your turn to tell him. No, it's your turn to tell him. Uh, <clears throat> the White House cannot function that way. But no one was better at telling presidents hard truths than Ronald Reagan's first chief of staff, James A. Baker III. I want to play one more excerpt from our documentary uh, showing Baker in action. If we can find it here, let's see. President Reagan was, uh, was adamant about not raising taxes. It's something he felt viscerally about. But we had this major league uh, deficit and our economic advisors were telling us was going to spook the markets. And I never will forget being there in the Oval with him. And finally he said, all right, damn it. It's the wrong thing to do. And he took his glasses off and threw them on the desk. And he was pissed. And if Baker had perfected the art of steering the president on matters of policy, he was also adept at pulling him back from impulsive decisions. President Reagan has been unhappy for some time about leaks from his administration to the press, but one in particular, it turns out, really has him worked up. In 1983, classified information was leaked from a national security meeting. The president was so furious, he called for every cabinet member and the vice president to take a lie detector test. I was riding in a car on my way uh, to the Madison Hotel in, in Washington, and I was livid, and I, I said, turn the car around. So we turned the car around and, uh, and went back to the White House, and I went busting into the Oval Office, and I stood there at the table, and I said, this would be a terrible thing, in my view, for your administration. Look, you can't strap up to a polygraph the Vice President of the United States. He was elected. He's a constitutional officer. Well, President Reagan really realized, of course, that he'd made a terrible mistake, and the president rescinded everything he'd done, which was exactly, of course, what he should have done. <clears throat> so now, fast forward to today, and compare that with what is happening in the Trump White House. Consider Trump's recent firing of James Comey, and the fact that Trump met with the FBI director privately in an apparent effort to quash an investigation. Can you imagine such a meeting happening on Jim Baker or Leon Panetta's watch? The answer is it never would have happened. And this is just the latest and most dramatic example of a president who has no one who will tell him what he doesn't want to hear. But chiefs of staff don't just save presidents from themselves. They make governing possible. Uh, our current president is finding out that you cannot run the White House like a family real estate firm in Manhattan with advisors coming and going, and no one empowered as chief, uh, and no chain of command. Gerald Ford tried it in 1974. Instead of having a powerful gatekeeper, he gave his senior aides equal access to the Oval Office, coming and going. He called this model the spokes of the wheel, with Ford at the center. 
It was a disaster. Within a month, Ford was begging his friend Don Rumsfeld, who was ambassador to NATO, um, to come into the White House and, uh, and take charge. And Rumsfeld had a condition. He wanted as his deputy a young man who might not pass his FBI background check. He'd been thrown out of college twice, had a history of drinking and driving, and once woke up on the floor of a jail cell in Wyoming. That person's name, of course, was Dick Cheney. But Rumsfeld and Cheney succeeded, uh, who succeeded his mentor as chief during the last year of Ford's presidency, proved to be two of the most effective White House chiefs in history. And with their help, Ford almost caught Jimmy Carter in the election. By that time, Ford's spokes of the wheel model had become such a joke around the White House that it wound up being immortalized. On Dick Cheney's last day as chief, he was presented with a beautifully wrapped gift. Inside, he found a mangled bicycle wheel <laughs> with every spoke broken. Cheney loved it. But instead of taking it home and putting it on a garage shelf, he propped it up on his desk where he knew his successor, Hamilton Jordan, would find it later that day. And he attached a note. Dear Hamilton, beware the spokes of the wheel. R regards, Dick Cheney. <clears throat> of course, Jordan's boss, Jimmy Carter, was arguably the most intelligent president of the 20th century, trained as a nuclear engineer. Uh, Ronald Reagan uh, was not so much. But Reagan intuited something that Carter did not understand, and Trump has yet to grasp, and that is an outsider president needs a consummate insider in order to govern effectively. Um, Reagan found that person in the form of James Baker. Carter was convinced he could run the White House by himself and didn't even appoint a chief. And then two and a half years in, he was unable to prioritize or govern effectively. Um, bogged down in minutia. <coughs> Excuse me. Finally, he gave Ham Jordan the title and the responsibilities of White House Chief of Staff. Decades later, Bill Clinton made the same mistake. Uh, his chief, a childhood friend named Mac McClarty, was unable to impose discipline on the president or on the White House. Um, within a year and a half, Clinton was dead in the water, unable to get traction for his agenda, uh, bogged down in scandals like Whitewater and Travelgate, as, we may, as you may remember. He might have been a one-term president, if not for a kind of intervention by Hillary Clinton and Al Gore. They told him his White House was broken, and his only chance of fixing it was to find and empower a new White House chief. They had somebody in mind, Leon Panetta, Clinton's tough, disciplined OMB director. But Panetta loved being OMB director and didn't want the job, so they kidnapped him. They, they flew him to Camp David and locked him in a cabin <laughs> with Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Al Gore, and Tipper Gore. The president looked at Panetta and said, Leon, you can be the greatest OMB director in history, but if the White House is broken, no one will remember you. Panetta took the hint and the job, and with help from his deputy, Erskine Bowles, he turned Clinton's White House around, setting the stage for Clinton's re-election. But taming Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton wasn't always easy for Panetta or his deputies, and I want to play one more clip that will give you an idea of what they were up against. One day the president came out of his office and he had another of his great ideas. And I turned to him and I said, Mr. President, you have got to go back in that Oval Office now. And you got to go back and look at this list of things that you and I agreed you wanted to get done. Not that I wanted to get done, but you wanted to get done. And if you will stay focused on those three or four things, I can set up the organization and the structure and the focus to make them real. But you can't do a thousand things. So a guy who has a thousand visions is no better than a guy like me, a dummy who doesn't have any vision. Bill Clinton kept his chiefs on their toes, juggling his changing priorities and bracing for his explosive temper, the so-called purple rages. Bill Clinton used to go 40 feet off the ground sometimes. You know, he'd come in in the morning and uh, something had bothered him and, uh, you know, he had, to, he had to let it out and uh, you, you kind of let him go through it. 
uh, because it was good therapy for him. But you knew that ultimately he'd come back to Earth, and he would then say, okay, what do we have to do? We were gonna have a relationship with, that was that was a peer relationship. And, you know, I had big boy pants on, and if he acted like that around me, I was gonna leave, and he knew that. The president used to love to play cards on Air Force One. One evening, there was some crisis going on in the world. He needed to talk to one of the foreign leaders. He'll remain nameless. All of a sudden, the phone rings, and the president picks it up. He's got connected, and we were playing hearts, and uh, the president lost a trick that he really wanted to win, and he said, just as he threw his card down, Damn it! And uh, you could hear the translator on the other end of the phone saying, "Mr. President," and and the president sheepishly sort of saying, "No, no, no! It's not the, it's, uh, that's not meant for him. I'm just uh, something else is going on here." Clinton's temper tested his staff, and so did the president's sleep habits. It's usually the chief who wakes the president in the middle of the night, but the famously nocturnal Clinton turned the tables. He woke me up a lot, <laughs> even when I wasn't working with him. If it was after 11 o'clock at night, the phone rang, and I knew it was probably Bill Clinton. <laughs> it was about 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and I get a call from the president. And I said, holy cow, what's going on? And he, and he said, Leon, are you watching Fritz Hollings on C-SPAN? I said, are you kidding me, Mr. President? I said, nobody in the country is watching Fritz Hollings on C-SPAN right now. Everybody's asleep, and you should be asleep, too. <clears throat> so that was, that was Bill Clinton's version of tweeting, I guess. Um, you know, history shows that from Watergate to the Iran-Contra scandal to the Iraq War to the Monica Lewinsky affair to the rollout of Obamacare, the botched executive orders on immigration, the White House chief of staff often makes the difference between success and disaster. Uh, presidents, and, and perhaps our current president more than any other, arrive in the Oval Office intoxicated by victory, full of hubris that comes with winning the presidency. As Dick Cheney told me, the attitude of the winners toward the losers is, well, if you guys are so smart, how come we beat you? And that may be why we see presidents make the same mistakes again and again and fail to empower someone who can tell them hard truths. As Jimmy Carter's speechwriter James Fallows told me, it would, it would be natural for anyone having won the presidency to think that it's me and my qualities and my judgment and my goodness. There is that fallibility of thinking you're the smartest person in the room. You know, Harry Truman knew better. When he learned that Dwight Eisenhower had been elected, Truman said, poor Ike. He'll snap his fingers and he'll say, do this, do that, and nothing will happen. <laughs> it isn't a bit like the military. Fallows also told me, it's difficult to have the tragic imag imagination of how hard it really is to be president. I love that phrase, tragic imagination. Uh, you know, presidents who are ignorant of history do not have that attribute the self-awareness that's necessary to do the job. And time and again, they make the mistake of thinking they can run the White House by themselves. It, it never ends well. Let me, um, let me finish with a quick story, because I want to I wanna get to your questions uh, and not bore you. Um, on a cold December morning in, in June, in, in, I'm sorry, in, in, in January 2008, 13 former chiefs of staff came to the White House at the invitation of the outgoing chief, Josh Bolton. They had come to give uh, Rahm Emanuel advice. Rahm was the incoming chief for Barack Obama. You know, they represented the whole spectrum of ideology from Cheney and Rumsfeld to Leon Panetta and John Podesta. And they sat around the table and took turns giving Emanuel advice. When it was Dick Cheney's turn, uh, George W. Bush's powerful vice president looked up at Rahm over his glasses and said gravely, at all costs, control your vice president. <laughs> <coughs> it, it brought down the house. Um, 
it was a gathering with lighthearted moments, but in another way, it was also profound. Because those White House chiefs had come together to put country ahead of party. It was a time of crisis, with the world on the verge of a Great Depression, two wars mired in stalemate, and all of them wanted Rahm Emanuel and Barack Obama to succeed. None of the former White House chiefs I interviewed have, would, have, would have countenanced what's happening in the current White House. The contempt for democratic institutions, the attacks on the judiciary and the press, and the flagrant demonstrable lies being told by and on behalf of the president. You know, from Dick Cheney to Dennis McDonough, the chiefs I got to know had something in common. Their respect for the office transcended their allegiance to the boss. That's the way it should be and the way it no longer is. Today we're finding out if we're a nation of laws. We're also finding out if we're a nation that still respects the unwritten rules of governance that 17 White House chiefs of staff have done their best to uphold over the last half century. It was my privilege to get to know them. I hope my book does justice to them uh, and is a reminder of what government can be. So with that, thank you all for coming, and I'll take your questions. Um, Q&A now. Yep. You, you neglect uh, Ronald Reagan's real chief of staff, his wife. <laughs> okay? You didn't mention her at all. Well, I'm glad you brought her up. Uh, you know, Nancy Reagan was famously called the personnel director in the Reagan White House. She had usually infallible antenna for personnel decisions and who was good for Ronnie and who was not. Um, her instincts failed her only once that I can think of, but critically, because, and this will give you an idea of how important the White House Chief of Staff can be. When Baker, when James Baker was burned out after four years and, and desperate to get out of the job, um, one day the Treasury Secretary, Donald Regan, said, Jim, why don't we just swap jobs? was oblivious, uh, especially in the White House basement, where, guess what happened? The Iran conflict. Um, so, in my opinion, the Iran Contra scandal never would have happened on Jim Baker's watch. Uh, he would have put a stake in it. Um, but Don Regan, because he was imperious and oblivious to, to what was going on, and because, as one White House chief put it to me, he thought he was the CEO and Reagan was the retired chairman of the board. <laughs> uh, he, he was arguably the least successful White House chief in history. Long-winded long answer to your question about Nancy, but Nancy was usually very attuned to Reagan's needs, and this was the one time she failed. Why? I think I think Rom I think Rom was actually a lot of that was just an act. A lot of that was you know Rom's profanity. Um, underneath that profane exterior, um, Rom was a true believer in Obama's agenda. Whether you like what, you know whatever your opinion may be of it. Uh, and, he was, and he was a guy who, as, as, um, as somebody once put it, he was a guy who took the hill. You know, when you gave Rahm Emanuel a, a task, he always got, there were dead bodies in his wake, but the job got done. Okay, let's take another question, maybe from the back. And then we'll do some more up front. We have more. <laughs> Well, there's so much to think about. Learn 
been so much concern about. So I guess I'm going to like to No, I don't think I don't think your uh, mic is on. Is this better? Yeah. <clears throat> I guess I would like to uh, start with the uh, since this is your topic and this is your book, who is really going to be the chief of staff, if any, in the current White House? <laughs> Any, anybody else's guess is as good as mine. Um, but the problem, the problem is fundamentally with Donald Trump. Trump does not understand how much he needs an empowered White House chief of staff you know, this is a broken White House. It's, it may be broken beyond repair. Um, oh, no, come on. In every, in ev I said it may be, it may be broken beyond repair. Um, <clears throat> but in every, in every basic way, um, this White House has shown that it doesn't know what it's doing. It's been unable to uh, execute executive orders. It's been unable to come up with coherent legislation. It's been unable to set priorities for the president's agenda. It can't communicate. Um, in every way, it is failing. And the only hope I think Trump has of governing is some kind of intervention. I mean, it worked for Bill Clinton. It, it may not work for Trump. But the only way, thing I can think of is, is for someone to go and close the door to the Oval Office and say, look, you have a choice. If you want to be Jimmy Carter, a one-term president, keep doing exactly what you're doing. If you want to be Ronald Reagan, you have to find your equivalent of James Baker and empower him to tell you what you don't want to hear. And for openers, you're going to stop tweeting or you're going to run those tweets by the chief of staff before they go out. So that's, I, but I don't know who that person is. And at this point, it's hard to imagine who would want the job, quite frankly. Over here? There's one right here, but I'm okay. not sure if the mic is on. Oh. <clears throat> yeah, it's on. It's on. Yeah. Uh, Chris, um, what has changed over history in that, so that it has the velocity of events just increased or the presence of them so that, you know, starting back with, say, FDR, um, FDR, Truman, <coughs> uh, and, and Eisenhower coming forward, didn't have chiefs of staff, or did they? And, and yeah, that's a good. No, it's a it's a very good question. And it, it you know the first arguably the first chief of the first real chief of staff was appointed by Eisenhower, Sherman Adams, who was the civilian version of Ike's Army Chief of Staff. He was a famously gruff, tough, monosyllabic character, and they called him the abominable no man. <laughs> that's how good a gatekeeper he was. Uh, but after Eisenhower, both Kennedy and Johnson tried to govern without chiefs, in a, in, a, in a way, the way Jerry Ford tried, with spokes of the wheel, equal access, a bunch of senior advisors. It didn't end well for, for either one. Um, and so, you know, it, it, part of it is that government is so much larger, so much more unwieldy. There are so many, it is so much more complicated and difficult uh, to govern now than it was when FDR was around. Um, but a lot, but, but history has shown from Nixon to the present that every president who has tried to do it without a chief ends up regretting it. One from the back. Hi, Chris. What would be the ultimate circumstances for a woman to be a chief of staff? <clears throat> <laughs> it's, um, it's about time, right? Um, it almost happened with uh, Obama. There was a contender uh, by the name of Nancy Ann DeParle. Uh, she was, she created uh, Obamacare, really. She was um, the policy person behind Obamacare. She, she wasn't 
um, adept at polit politics. She didn't know the Hill as well as Dennis McDonough, who wound up getting the job during the latter part of Obama's uh, term, uh, it, uh, presidency. So, but she was a she she came close, and Obama was a president who was comfortable with strong women. Um, current president, we'll see. Um, it's going to happen. I mean, think of how many how many female presidents have we had? How many female campaign managers have we had? Very few. But that'll change. First of all, thank you for that most eloquent and informative presentation. You mentioned Ron Emanuel and the public versus the personal persona. When you um, did, well, you had the research and then you did the interviews. Which of the chiefs of staff did you find that their personal persona was quite different from the public <clears throat> persona? That's a great question. Um, Rob's persona was was the same in the interview as it as it is <laughs> as the persona you we, you know we all know and love. Uh, he was he was a, a handful. He was constantly using the f bomb. He was constantly challenging me and tormenting me through the whole interview. It was a lot of fun to do actually. Um, the big surprise was probably Dick Cheney, and one of the great stories in the book is that. When Dick Cheney was uh, Gerald Ford's 34-year-old White House Chief of Staff, he was, believe it or not, the most popular guy in Washington. He was, he had a self, this self-effacing sense of humor. He loved playing pranks on reporters. The press corps loved him. He was a straight shooter. He was one of the most effective White House Chiefs and very laid back. His Secret Service code name was Backseat. Uh, so it's, it's become almost a parlor game among all the chiefs ever since. What happened to that guy, <laughs> right? And there, there are a bunch of theories. One theory is that it, uh, Brent Scowcroft, his best friend until they had a falling out over the Iraq war, um, is, was convinced that it was his heart condition. Uh, somebody else, another chief, told me that he thought that Cheney had gone to the dark side as CEO of Halliburton, that that changes people, being CEO of that kind of company. Um, <clears throat> others think it was 9-11. I think Cheney would tell you the world didn't, uh, I didn't change, the world changed on 9-11. I, my, my personal theory is that Cheney, um, the, the Cheney when he became Bush's vice president, he had nothing left to prove. He had no further political ambitions. It was the last stop on this railroad. And they, he just felt liberated to tell people exactly what he thought of them. <laughs> Uh, including famously Pat Leahy, you remember, may remember. Um, <clears throat> but Cheney is, can, can be, in person, extraordinarily charming. He's very smart. He's very funny. He loves the whole Darth Vader image. Uh, he loved it when I, I was in Wyoming at his, at his um, house in Jackson Hole um, right after... Uh, Cheney had said that Barack Obama was the worst president of his lifetime, and Obama's reply was that Cheney was the worst president of his lifetime. <laughs> and Cheney loved it. He loved that. He thought it was hilarious. So he'd, he'd love the way my wife Carrie found him on warcriminals.org. I guarantee he would love that. So he was the most surprising. One from the back, maybe? If not, I have one right. When Trump was running for president, he indicated that if he were elected, the vice president would do all the presidential things, and he would do the important things. <laughs> How do you think this worked out? <clears throat> it's, it's, it's a formula for failure. Um, you know, at one point when Carter was still, when Jimmy Carter was still resisting appointing a White House chief of staff, there was a, they, tr they had the idea that Walter Mondale, his vice president, could be in charge of prioritizing, and, and it, just, it just doesn't work. Um, vice presidents are not cut out for that, and it was a mistake in the case of George W. Bush to invest so much power in Dick Cheney, uh, in my opinion. Uh, 
So 24-7 news and social media are fairly recent. Like that? Oh, okay. 24-7 um, news and social media are fairly recent phenomena in this whole you know, dynamic that you're talking about. How do you see them playing a role in how anybody governs, whether it's a president or a senator or anybody? It, it seems more a curse than a blessing. Well, it's it simply made the job of the of the White House chief and governing in general uh, even more difficult and relentless. I mean, there's no such thing as a news cycle anymore. It's a constant. It's just a constant bombardment. Um, and and every White House, the Clinton White House, used to just focus on on the the evening news and winning that news cycle, and then everybody went home. It's just not the case. It's now 24-7, it's relentless, and, and quite frankly, um, our president's uh, twi Twitter habit is another example of something that is just, uh, you know, just completely, it's, it's made his job, it's crippled his ability to govern. Um, the most precious asset that any administration has is the president's time. And the way you use that time, and the way you, de you the way you s safeguard it, and the way you deploy the president, is is everything in terms of staying on message, staying disciplined, um, and that's been obliterated by Trump's Twitter habit. Uh, the, you know, it's it's become mission impossible for a chief of staff to keep everybody on the same page when the president is ripping up the script every ten minutes on Twitter. Other questions? Okay. <clears throat> Who said in the White House, I don't want a sparrow to land on the White House lawn without me knowing about it? Don Regan. And then he didn't notice this cockamamie scheme that was being hatched in the basement <laughs> called Iran Contra. So anyway, if that answers your question. Could you uh, could you give some examples uh, historically of of uh, some chiefs of staff who were very reluctant to uh, confront the president with, uh, with <clears throat> the truth and and the problems that might have resulted? Yeah. Well, you know it's the most important thing any chief of staff does is is tell the president what he doesn't want to hear, um, and. Um, that can be difficult for chiefs of staff who are really close friends, I think. I, I think that uh, Thomas McLarty, Mac McLarty, who was Bill Clinton's first White House chief and a, a lovely guy, I mean, the most popular guy in town, they, Mac the Nice is what it was his nickname. <clears throat> but I think he had trouble, as any of us would, trying to tell uh, somebody he'd known since kindergarten that he was completely wrong and that he had to change. Uh, or, or change course. Um, I don't want to pick on Mac because I think he, it, it, I think Clinton failed to empower him in the same way that Donald Trump has failed to empower Reince Priebus. Um, so I don't think it was Mac's fault um, by any means. But they did have to change, uh, make that change a year and a half in, and I think Clinton would have been a one-term president, um, possibly, if Panetta hadn't come in and really turn that White House around. We probably have time for one more question. Oh, oh, this is a good one too. This is one of our interns from New Canaan High School and he's interning at the Advertiser. <laughs> you talked about how Clinton, having a uh, chief of staff on his staff, helped him with the reelection and getting a second term. What do you think the odds are that Trump getting a chief of staff can help him improve his image for a reelection in 2020? I mean, obviously, compared to then, we're kind of in a political landscape where yeah. it's uh, <clears throat> much harder to predict what's going to happen, say, any given week. But what are the odds that he can even get reelected without a chief of staff by his side? It's a, it's a great question, and it's a really tough one. Um, but fundamentally, Trump has to decide that something is broken um, and that it needs to be fixed. And he has to empower a White House chief if he wants to be able to govern. One chief told me that this is like 
a little bit like alcoholism. Every president has to hit rock bottom before they recognize that they need to change. And so it's a fair question whether Trump would recognize rock bottom if he saw it. Um, and it, on top of that, you've got the problem that, um, you know, Leon Panetta's and Jim Baker's um, don't grow on trees. I mean, these are, these are guys who are really extraordinary, exceptional, tough, smart, savvy people who are comfortable in their own skin, who can walk in and deliver a message like that. They're not easy to find. Uh, and it may not be easy to find anybody who's dying to work in this White House, uh, given everything that's happened. Um, and then finally, as I've said before, it, it, all, it all starts at the top. It has to come from Donald Trump, and until he, until he realizes that he, this, this is what he needs to do, I, I, don't think, I don't think there's anything anyone else can do for him. Okay, I think we're out of time for Q&A. Once again, thank you, Chris. Thank you. If you're interested in buying Chris's book, The Gatekeeper, it is still for sale in the lobby via Elm Street Books, and thank you again for your partnership. If you bought a book and you would like it signed, we're going to get a book signing set up here. Please line up on the left-hand side, your right, of the room, and we'll get it queued up, and Chris will do some book signing. Thank you again.
I'm not an invalid. No, I know, but every, all of us can use an extra hand every once in a while. Nicely done. There you go. All right. Have a good job.
It's right here. 